Next question, back to the medicine side here. Why is there such a large rise in colon cancer? All right, so let me give people a lay of the land, and then I'll, I'll pose the question directly to you. So in the United States, there's approximately 150,000 new cases of large bowel cancer uh, every year. So that's just your large colon. Uh, annually, about 50,000 people die from colorectal cancer in the United States, uh, and their lifetime incidence of colorectal cancer is about 4%. Okay? In the United States, colorectal cancer incidence rates have been declining by approximately 2% per year, but this rate of decline has slowed to approximately 1.2% per year in the period from 2014 to 2018. So it's been going down, but then as of late, it's been going down less. And notably, in the United States, the declining mortality overall is masking trends in younger adults. So colorectal mortality rates per 100,000 people in the population amongst individuals uh, aged less than 50 have declined by about 2% per year from 2000 to 2004, but then after that has been increasing by about 1% uh, through 2018. So things have been going down for like years and years and years, and now as of late, they've been going up, especially in people under the age of 50. So overall, the incidence of colorectal cancer is increasing in individuals under the age of 50, while it is decreasing in older individuals in the United States and Western countries. So with that lay of the land out of the way, Dr. Baraki, why is there such a large rise in colon cancer in younger people? Yeah, certainly a concerning finding and pretty relevant as at the moment I am happen to be taking care of somebody with this very issue at the moment, which is uh, pretty, pretty tough to, to watch that happen to somebody so young. And uh, it's something that's been investigated quite a bit. I don't think that we have a single, you know, definitive cause nailed for this kind of thing. Most, as with most cancers, there are a couple cancers that are like pretty simple. And it's like, you got this one gene mutation and that's it. And if we yep. treat that one gene mutation, then this becomes a treatable cancer, like CML, for example. But most cancers are much more complex, multifactorial, um, not necessarily homogeneous, meaning they're not all the same. Even if you have the same cancer diagnosis, you have unique tumor biology between people and, and things that may have predisposed you or led to it, or certain different levels of aggressiveness and how it manifests in you. So all in all, super complex field. There's a reason why there are people who dedicate their lives to studying this and people who specialize and dedicate their lives to, to treating it. And I'm not one of those people, even though mm -hmm. I see folks with cancer daily or the complications of cancer, et cetera. As it relates to colorectal cancer, it's something that does have a lot of different risk factors, a lot of predisposing things, some genetic, uh, less commonly, and then some things that are more behaviorally related. And so uh, obesity is a major variable here. It's one of the obesity-associated cancers. There's a, a list of those, obesity, and it's associated oftentimes, you know, insufficiently active uh, lifestyle habits. The quote unquote Western diet, which involves a lot of consumption of highly processed meats and and low generally low fiber intake from from whole foods are things that are pretty consistently and strongly linked to the risk of colorectal cancer. And then other things like alcohol and smoking have some relationship. Uh, it might not be quite as strong as some of these other variables. There are tons of other kind of hypotheses that are being investigated. For example, are there issues with the gut microbiome that increases this risk or is that just a you know another derangement that happens because of the diet and the activity, mm -hmm. or is one causing the other? It's hard. It's hard to say. Um, various aspects around inflammation. We know, for example, patients with inflammatory bowel disease are at much, much, much higher risk of developing colon cancer. So they get screened way more aggressively, starting much earlier in life. And so, yeah, there's a ton of other kind of hypothetical or, or um, uh, things that are being researched. But I think that the best guess at the moment is kind of this westernized diet, obesity, and the associated behaviors as far as the biggest, at least mod uh, easily modifiable factors on the individual level to mitigate your risk of colorectal cancer. So shifting the dietary pattern in a much healthier direction, increasing fiber from whole food sources, maintaining you know healthy body composition, physical activity, not smoking, not drinking, all the usual things that any good doctor would tell you, things that we advise frequently, would be most of the things that I would advise to mitigate your risk as much as possible. And then if you wanted to take it further than that, then initiating you know age appropriate screening when that when that time comes uh, by working with a physician on that. Yeah, a lot a lot of the conditions that we see like an increased quote unquote prevalence of particularly during this era of, mod, you know, modernity, I just initially go to obesity, insufficient physical activity, and the current dietary pattern because from a time perspective, temporally, it just makes sense. Most of these conditions have like a long or relatively long latent period. You know, they start early and then insidiously kind of turn into a problem later uh, in life. And yeah, we're talking about people under the age of 50, but, you know, 30s and 40s, that, that's not 
exactly like a short term sort of thing. This has been going on festering for, for a long period of time, these risk factors where people are carrying too much adipose tissue, where people are eating a, a dietary pattern that's not really that health promoting and they're insufficiently active. And so to me, those are the most likely smoking guns, so to speak. And then we can identify other things that are downstream from that. But I don't feel confident enough to say like, ah, it's just obesity. So yeah. and hand wave it away because that would be uh, a smooth brain take uh, as we've. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So do you want to talk about screening real quick? Because these have recently changed and I just want people who are listening to this. They're probably some folks in this demographic, you know. Yeah. So the guidelines re did recently change within the past, it might have been the last year or two years ago, uh, whereas historically average risk individuals, so those who don't necessarily, for example, have inflammatory bowel disease or you have a first degree relative who is diagnosed with colon cancer at an early age, if you don't have those kind of risk factors that would put you at elevated risk, that would make you average risk. And historically, average risk individuals were advised for screening at age 50. Um, those, uh, because of these trends that have been observed, uh, that guidance has shifted a bit to initiate at age 45. There are There is admittedly some controversy around this, both within the US and, and worldwide, and we don't necessarily need to get into the, all the weeds on that here. Uh, there are different modalities that can be used for colorectal cancer screening, stool-based tests uh, that are aimed to be initially non-invasive, and then if they're positive, then you would proceed to a more invasive test like a colonoscopy or a flexible sigmoidoscopy, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so those are things to discuss one-on-one -on -one with your uh, physician to see if, uh, you know, which one, if any, is more or less appropriate for you. And then the other consideration that is maybe less applicable to our listeners, but something that I teach about a lot has to do with uh, not only when to start screening, but when to stop screening, when it does not make sense to screen somebody for these things anymore at the older age of the spectrum. It's like 80 something, isn't it? Well, it, vary, it varies based on the patient, right? So mm -hmm. you, if you see an absolute kick-ass 80-year-old who looks like they're going to live for another 40 years, then you, know, you might have a conversation with them and they might want to continue screening. And others who maybe by that age, they're on death's door, unfortunately, due to other reasons, and it might be a situation where it's no longer appropriate. And so for my trainees that I work with, I often point them to help them understand these concepts to actually an online tool from UCSF. It's called the e-prognosis tool. So I just have them Google UCSF e-prognosis, and on that website, you can actually click the option of, for example, cancer screening relating to breast cancer screening or colon cancer screening, and you can put in your patient's demographics, and it actually helps you weigh out what are the potential benefits of screening mm -hmm. and what are the potential harms, and is it actually worth pursuing this in the particular patient that I'm seeing. Yeah, I like that. We'll have to come up with our own gains tool for there resistance training. Would resistance training benefit this patient? 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah, permanently set it to yes ick without, uh, with very, very rare exceptions. Yeah, it's somebody said, do you have an emergent condition that needs to yeah. be, you know? Do you yeah. have complete obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Okay, yeah, maybe or, pause until we fix that. <laughs> yeah, or imperforated anus, one of the two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 